Hey, White Sox fans, it's Brett Valentini here. And let's face it, I'm your favorite White Sox fan, right? I'm your favorite fellow White Sox fan. Somehow I host a number of these podcasts, including Southside Sox on the farm. We had one just yesterday with Darren Black running down the system. We got a special treat. This is a special treat. This is number 12. And we got Dan Victor. Dan Victor, I... You know, whenever I add somebody to the South Side and we got a lot of people on staff, I always say it's a great free agent acquisition. We made, you know, great, great new talent. The first real, true, great free agent acquisition I made for South Side Sox back, man, it's got to be th three years ago, pretty much for the, when, I, when I took over doing this. It was Dan Victor. I saw this guy, I said, I got to get in touch with Dan Victor. I got to see if Dan Victor wants to write for South Side Sox. <laughs> Lucky for us, he sure did. And finally, for the first time, long rumored, long threatened, but finally happening, Dan Victor joins us on a Southside Sox podcast. Welcome, Dan. It's great to have you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Glad to be here, Brett. Um, now, now, concurrent you know, with... You know, go, go ahead. You said what a great free agent acquisition mm -hmm. that was. Mm -hmm. I was wondering when I can expect the Louis <laughs> kind of money. Well, that's extension talk. And believe me, once I get mine, everybody going to get there. <laughs> uh, but yeah, unfortunately, there's a hierarchy, which doesn't even involve me. So yes, uh, trust me, you are, um, let's see, I'm looking at my list. Very high on the list, Dan. Trust me, very high on the list. Uh, concurrent with this podcast is uh, a, one of a couple of pieces Dan's put together for us. Uh, really focusing on the scouting process, the draft right now up this morning is Dan's look at some of the highlights of the 2021 drafts. So we're going to go through that in the first half of this podcast. And then second half, we'll probably just take a little bit of a look at the system, maybe focusing on Kannapolis where Dan is the man, but uh, probably uh, um, system wide. And we're going to go through a little bit of what he's seen. We get a lot of what uh, Darren Black sees uh, because he's sort of our regular guy on the farm. Dan's moving in here. No crashing by Venus Victor yet uh, on this podcast, but it could still happen. It could still happen. Okay, so let's talk draft. Uh, Dan, everybody's always hyped about their drafts. Everybody talks it up. It's always the best draft ever. But to read into what you're saying and everything we've heard about this draft, the White Sox, in a sense, maybe almost got three first round talents in their first three picks. Yes. Um, every team hypes their, their picks. Every team, every year. The only time, that's the big difference between fantasy baseball and real baseball, is that if you go to a fantasy draft, people will tell you how bad they did. <laughs> if you hear from the MLB guys, they will tell you how great they did every year, no matter how it goes. Um, and, you know, typically your top guys will be inserted you know, sight unseen in the minors, they will be inserted at the right. top of your prospect list. And then we watch the, you know, the uh, Trey Michael Shesky's uh, right. fall from fall from graces after they've been there for a minute. Right. Um, but this year, think about it. Now, we lost uh, 35 picks from the 2020 draft and we lost 20 picks from the uh, 2021 draft. So this was a really, really deep draft. Like, unparalleled right so i think that this year we're going to see when they tell us that somebody was a third round pick or a, or a first round talent and i think that they really mean it and uh this draft looks phenomenal on paper so i'm hoping that when i see them on the field i will agree and they will uh validate everything that i've heard and everything that i've uh talked to the guys about the fact that kath is a second round pick went sort of one to sort of similar enough profile to the first rounder in Montgomery. Um, that was a case. I mean, really with the second and the third round pick, but, but certainly just with calf, it was almost like they had him sort of on their board, even in the first round. And when he was still alive in the second round, it's almost like, even though we're not duplicating picks, but we're sort of going to the same well, you, but they couldn't pass him up. Absolutely not. Um, I think Colson Montgomery, had, well, right now he certainly has more current power. Mm -hmm. um, and he's quite an athlete. He was a high school football player, I understand, as a freshman, a quarterback. Uh, he was a very good basketball player. Yeah. And, uh, and he's a fantastic baseball player. But um, the power, I think the power is going to be there right away. 
uh, the athleticism, and he's supposed to be a very, very hard worker. So I'm excited about him, and I'm excited about Kath. I heard, uh, you know, we heard Corey Seager comps with uh, yeah. Colson Montgomery. I heard uh, Michael Brantley comps with uh, mm. West Cat. And that was one of the guys that all the uh, White Sox fans wanted in free agency. So That's true. let's let's see if we can get a younger version and watch him watch him sure. blow up. Sure. Um, and then in terms of uh, uh, Burke, they sort of go college. OK, when we had our, uh, uh, our post draft podcast, I sort of threw it out there because it turns out that it was still mostly college guys pick. But really, it's not looking at the whole draft because there's a strategy to that. And obviously picking a lot of these guys who can't go anywhere else. You know, there's a reason. You're loading up on guys from maybe fourth year seniors. Can't go anywhere where else. Give them a, a lower bonus because then you can put your money into the, the preps and try and entice guys away. So we should be looking at really like five key picks when we judge whether or not the White Sox are changing sort of their trend, uh, which in the past had been to maybe shy away from prep players. Uh, but the fact that the top two and really three of the key picks taken were prep guys uh, it doesn't make the idea that the White Sox didn't really commit strong to prep guys. That sort of rings hollow because where it really counted, they did do that. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I would say that four of their key guys in the draft were prep, were prep guys. And Montgomery, Kath, uh, Tanner McDougal, who I'm sure we're going to talk about, and then Cam Butler, who the organization and the signing scout responsible for Cam Butler is absolutely in love with the kid. And through their excitement, I am really stoked about what he brings to the table. I can't wait to see him. And seriously, if uh, you, you may be listening to this or, or watching this first before you've read Dan's article, but seriously, you can pause this. You have permission to do that. Read this article. Dan has dug and got some a great variety of information. He's talked to the draftees themselves. He's talked to White Sox scouts. Uh, he's talked to guys, coaches, the, the guys who know these players. It's a great combination for, for a piece that's just a couple thousand words. You'd think it was like 10,000 with all the great information he has jammed into this piece. So, so seriously, you can listen to us. Go ahead. I know you don't want to multitask, multi-platform. That's fine. Listen to us, but definitely do not skip reading this piece because it's just terrific in terms of the variety, uh, Dan, that you've put together with these guys quickly. I mean, the, the draft wasn't <laughs> two months ago. I mean, you know, you did this at not night of, but, uh, you know, in a, in a fairly quick amount of time, you spun around this piece that really highlights a, a, a good amount of these players in a terrific way for us. And I think it's going to be an enjoyable read uh, for everybody. Uh, I mean, tell me how you came about wanting to address the guys aside from the obvious that you ended up doing, you know, maybe a guy who's a little bit further down in the draft who jumped out at you and said, Hey, listen, I got to dig into this guy, or I already had my eye on him. Is there a couple guys like that who are uh, uh, popping up when I ask you that question? Um, sure. I got to tell you there, there's a kid that um, he was definitely, you know, one of the cheaper signees and he was the seventh rounder uh, taken out of Bradley. He was old for a senior because I believe he was a fifth year senior. Um, his name's Theo Denlinger and uh, this kid, he's built like a linebacker. He throws some high octane primo heat. I mean, he was bringing it, they said 97 to 99 at the, uh, the wood bat league. He was playing, uh, the Northwoods league that he was playing before the draft and, uh, supposedly on the stadium gun, he had, uh, achieved triple, triple digits as well. So, um, you know, those aren't always right, but he said that he's pretty confident that he's legit 97 to 99. He's got a two seamer with arm side run that, that bores in on right handers. He was uh, very um, confident in his two breaking balls. And, uh, and he's a very interesting kid. Uh, <laughs> Scott Merkin covered some of his interest in a piece that he had written. And uh, the kid is a, a blacksmith. Now, I don't know a lot of blacksmiths, especially 25-year-old <laughs> uh, kids that, uh, you know, work on making swords, battle axes, and knives with, uh, with an anvil and some heat in the backyard, but, but he does. Um, he's just an interesting kid, and he was also uh, adopted into the Lakota Sioux Indian mm -hmm. tribe. Um, he told, told me about that. Um, so he's an interesting kid, and he's a legitimately a, a big arm on him. So uh, we're going to see what he can do. I imagine he will get to uh, to low A pretty quickly, mm -hmm. given the um, the quality of the bullpen in Kannapolis right now, and the fact that he's an older college kid. 
I'm guessing there's a lot of guys his age who are blacksmiths just like virtually online in some role-playing game. Sure, they're probably making anvils and firing stuff up for real in their backyard. Yeah, probably not. I'm guessing that's not exactly, you know, the, you know they're, not, they're not necessarily funneling you toward that perhaps when you're going to your high school, high school guidance counselor, but that's a super, super cool bonus skill. And the guy who was picked right in front of him, we had talked in the earlier podcast, uh, Fraser Ellard, Ellard, I believe his name, uh, Trevor Lyons had picked up uh, some intel from some of his uh, former teammates uh, playing at the college level about sort of how on edge that guy was, uh, had a lot of like sort of gusto about him, a lot of aggression sort of on him, not, not in a bad way, but that motivational stuff. Uh, so sort of, it seems like back to back, the White Sox took these guys who have um, a little bit, maybe a little bit of attitude, uh, a little bit of upside as relievers. And this seems to be a trend that the White Sox are sort of trying to latch on to as well. Sort of those big, uh, oftentimes prep arms, big younger arms, uh, you know, maybe it's like the Will Cannon type profile, but uh, that seems to be something they're, they're sort of sticking with because it, it seems to be giving them at least some, some pretty good results. Absolutely. Um, I noticed it seemed to be a big trend this season as well, um, that they were looking for a lot of athletes, not just baseball players, right. but, but athletes. Yeah. Uh, Montgomery was a three-sport athlete. Sean Burke was a really good, uh, um, I'm sorry, high school basketball player. Uh, Goswine is a really good basketball player as well, although he told me that he had given it up uh, after his sophomore year. But he was described as very athletic. Um, Cam Butler, right. I believe, was a, was a three-sport athlete. I mm -hmm. could be wrong on that, but his, they described his ad athleticism as off the charts. 48-inch vertical leap. The kid can fly. Um, super strong some of the uh some of the measurables that were shared with me about cam butler were just insane i mean the kid hit now that wasn't even a typo i thought <laughs> no. he, he looked at it he hit 741 or no i'm sorry 742 his high school senior year with i believe 14 home runs and 32 stolen bases in 22 games um that'll play yeah and that wasn't him playing the video game version of the season that was him actually playing on the field it, it sounded like a video game. For sure. <laughs> um, now I was told he, he went to a small private school mm. and, you know, he's, they said, you know, a lot of times the pitchers could not throw very hard. You know, we're talking the 75, 80 mile an hour range, as opposed to the, you know, the, the 90 plus he's going to see every day in the minor league. So he expects uh, Adam Virtus was the signing scout and he expects there to be some swing and miss in Cam's uh, Cam's growing pains. But uh, he described him as a one percenter, said the kid just works and works and works. And he said that um, he's going to figure it out. And when he does, he's going to be really, really good. And hitting almost 750 would be hard to do off a tee. So I don't really care how hard his competition was throwing. That's very impressive. The stolen bases or whatever, that's incredibly impressive. It's like... You know, you could just throw the ball up and swing at it. I'm not sure you're going to hit, get a hit uh, three quarters of the time. Hey, let's talk about another trend with the White Sox, and that seems to be stealing fans from the north side. Uh, specifically, that would be Brooks Gaswine, uh, who apparently grew up a Chicago baseball fan, but his team, uh, his family sort of uh, skewed more Cubs, which is understandable. It hasn't been the best decade for the White Sox. Uh, but apparently he might be willing to, the family might be willing to negotiate their way into a Sox fandom. Yeah, he said that the uh, the family was more more angled toward the cub uh, the the cub nation, but he did say that they weren't one of those uh, you know one way or the other kind of families, and they have definitely uh, changed their tune. I don't know if they're going to throw out their cub stuff or whether they'll just hide it when he's home for a uh, break. But uh, he said that uh, they are now a a Sox family. The um... Uh, this is unique, obviously, I, I think, as you said, straight up top uh, and saying the piece, you know, this is a, a, as unique a draft as you're ever going to have. And it seems like, you know, every these past few years have been unique. Uh, maybe we had our last uh, 30, whatever, 40 round draft uh, uh, a couple of years ago. We had a five round draft last summer. Now we're at 20, which seems like maybe a little bit more or less what it might be going forward. A lot of changes to the minor leagues, uh, et cetera. So, of course, this is going to be a different sort of animal, very hard to you know, fully evaluate uh, a week later. 
Um, but your sense is, and it comes out in this piece, but your sense is, uh, you know, the White Sox did their work uh, through a variety. They didn't just focus on one area necessarily in, in a variety of areas. They've strengthened themselves. And what they really needed to do with this draft was sort of uh, uh, re replenish the system for that second wave, you know, maybe we're talking about later in the decade, mid later decade, when maybe some of the guys with the team now, who, who knows, might pick up a ring or two, or at least compete for one, uh, might be moving on, might be petering out, and they're going to need that next wave of guys coming up. And, and it, it, you feel at least again, a weekend a mission accomplished for the White Sox? As of now, yes. I was looking <laughs> yeah. at, a, I made a spreadsheet um, and I was analyzing the, the Kenny Williams era as the uh, in, as the front office guy, and I looked at the drafts from 2005 through 2016, um, because I figured that those were the ones that you know his fingerprint was on. Most of the people in the organization now were still there then, mm -hmm. and uh, because that gave me enough time to look at guys that should have at least made a, a mark in the major leagues, mm -hmm. and uh, the most I saw was uh, six picks from the. Hold on, I'm bringing it up in front of me. We had six picks from the 2016 draft mm -hmm. and the top 20 make their major league debut. Um, and, you know, I, I featured eight people in that article today that I think have a good chance of making the major leagues. And that didn't include the others that, you know, I don't know as much about as the ones that I, I covered for the article. Mm -hmm. So, um, and those were 40 round drafts. I, like I said, I looked at the top 20 picks because I was trying to compare apples to apples. But um, I think that this could be a really, really good draft. And we might look at this one 10 years down the line and say, oh, wow. At least I'm hoping. Yeah. Uh, all right. Listen, I can't uh, move on to our second half of our show without talking about a couple more guys. First of all, there's no way we're going to talk. And I'm not going to try to drag at least one of the Horn Frog players into the discussion. Johnny Ray seems to have himself an arm. He seems like a nice, uh, I guess a number of these guys are going to be sleeper picks, given how deep this draft could be, how thick this draft was with talent, given the fact that it's almost like uh, two years with the talent packed into one. Uh, this is a guy the White Sox think you know, they may have really made a find on in the uh, 12th round. Uh, yeah, when... When I was talking to uh, J.J. Lally about the guys that he had signed, which were uh, Goswine, uh, Denlinger, and Gusenberg, um, he had made a mention of Johnny Ray as well. And he said, so the kid's going to get to Kannapolis, and he's going to be throwing, throwing high octane and lighting up the radar gun, and people are going to be like, where the hell did they find this guy? <laughs> um, where did he come from? So I am looking forward to it because it sounds like, some of these uh, college arms could be quick, quick movers and maybe, uh, you know, get to the higher levels in short order and be ready to contribute in, you know, two years down the road. Let's finish up, Dan, with maybe the most intriguing name the White Sox picked. And the only thing I do when I'm paying attention to signings, aside from learning that we uh, White Sox signed their first rounder today, which you always want to do. You want to get that in the books. You don't want anything weird to happen with your first rounder. Um, but the one guy who seems like he might be most questionable to sign, and again, he might have already signed. All I do is look at signings and get angry at how low some of the bonus money is, but that is, Dan, an entirely different podcast, which we may address one day. Uh, Tanner McDougal uh, seems to be a stratospheric talent, and the White Sox are going to have to keep him in the fold. Uh, what are the chances of that, and what do you think about this guy? Because he seems very enticing. He sounds promising. I talked to his old high school coach uh, at length, and he sounds like a, not only a, a great pitcher, but a really great high character kid. Um, you know, he grew up around baseball. He was trained by three major leaguers that he's gotten his development. Mm -hmm. um, you know, David Risk, uh, Josh Towers, and his right. father was a seven year minor leaguer, I believe. Mm -hmm. But he's uh, six foot six. He throws 96 miles an hour. He's got elite spin on two breaking balls. Um, and I heard that he had, you know, a ceiling of a number two, you know, top of the rotation guy. And uh, I can't wait to see. That's another one. I just can't wait to see him. I hope that uh, he moves quickly and impresses them right off the bat. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason uh, as, as, 
It's unsavory. It can seem sometimes part of the reason for loading up on uh, maybe some of the, again, some of these guys who have nowhere else to go. So they're going to pretty much take whatever bonus, which I know has always, always been part of the baseball draft is so that you can really put together an offer that will make it clear that Tanner McDougal cannot go to college instead of starting his career with the White Sox. Uh, and this is, this is the way of the world. Now you have to, you have to throw everything you can at the guys that you've tabbed like the White Sox did with Jerry Kelly. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, uh, what a gift to fall into their lap. Very, very clever and crafty play by the White Sox, you know, their last year. And, and I think we're good. It seems like now this is becoming a trend with the White Sox and it's really exciting to see that there's always going to be this at least one guy who pops up and makes you say hey wait a minute how in the world did the White Sox get him and then they're going to get him right. so you know fingers crossed on 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 McDougal again for all I know he signed I, you know again all I do is look at signs and get angry but um that's going to be a guy who's going to be exciting to see even though he's not going to be somebody you would necessarily see in Kannapolis this year because he's so much of a younger player because he's young yeah but I, I believe that for the most part, they, they have a handshake agreement or a, a verbal agreement. When they make that phone call, they, they have a, a pretty good likelihood that they're going to get the deal done. Yeah. The team is floating an idea, say, hey, okay, this is what we think. And on the other side, they say, well, all right, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> but, you know, again, it can always change. You know, it can change. I imagine there are betrayals, but, uh, you know, it doesn't always have to be a Jerry Maguire story. But, um, yeah, so hopefully, yes. Fingers, fingers crossed there. Okay, we just spoke a little bit of Canapolis because that is now like the landing point for sort of like the real uh, baseball when it comes to the minors now because we have no more Great Falls. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. Be right back with Dan Victor, our ace guy. I call him our scout. He's a scout on staff. Uh, we're going to be talking about the system at large, not these new guys because they're not here yet. They're not even in Birmingham for their little training camp yet. Uh, we're going to talk about the guys playing for the White Sox right now. All six teams, the remaining six teams are in action now. And we're going to talk maybe about guys from each one of them, at least certainly starting with Kannapolis in just a minute. Hey, White Sox fans, we are back in a Southside Sox on the farm podcast. Well, we're going back to back. We just had 11. Ah, Darren Black, I talk to him all the time. I got a treat. You guys got a treat. It's Dan Victor talking to us. Check out his story. Again, that was part one. So we're not talking about that stuff anymore, but check out his story. We got another great piece coming from Dan, a little more esoteric, a little more artful even, I dare say, coming next week about building. Ah, well, I'm I'm going to just tease you. It's going to be good, though. It's going to be good. Okay, let's talk system, Dan. You're in Kannapolis. You're our guy on the ground in Kannapolis. We, we hear the Jose Rodriguez crack of the bat. We say, no, oh my God. And it's oftentimes Dan Victor shooting that footage. Uh, tell me what you've seen from that team. Let's start in Kannapolis because obviously the results are mind boggling. They are bewildering, uh, but there have been some real breakout players and probably some guys who maybe aren't showing in the uh, box score, uh, but maybe are showing you something more than what we're seeing in the box score. Um, when we lost Great Falls, um, you know, I think we lost kind of a key rung in development. And uh, what happened is because they, you know, we lost a whole year last season with COVID and they're trying to make up for lost time. So what happened is the, uh, they made some very aggressive assignments early in the year. They didn't want to leave these kids wait until uh, the Arizona League opened. And, uh, you know, Benjamin Bailey was sent to Kannapolis and struggled. Um, Lency Delgado is struggling mightily. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of that throughout. It's a very, very young team. We have a, almost everybody is a high school or an international free agent. I mean, the, the key players, most of them are right. either are drafted as very young international free agents or high school kids. And the growing pain, it's, it's painful to watch in Kannapolis this year. Um, you know, oftentimes we, we don't know if we're going to, we don't worry about whether we're going to win or lose. We just hope that we keep it respectable. Mm -hmm. um, the other day I was talking and I, we made the over under at six runs, whether they were going <laughs> to, whether they were going to lose by six or more. And I took the over and, and they lost by seven. <laughs> um, but you know, that they're going to have to get over the, 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 the developmental bumps and bruises and, Right now, it's just, it's ugly. There's a, a ton of strikeouts, um, a ton of errors, yeah. and a lot of, uh, a lot of play that you 
you question why did he throw that there? Why did he do that? You know, it's just young kids making um, very inexperienced errors. So uh, hopefully they get through all that and they get better as a result. But uh, there are some good players to watch. Jose Rodriguez is definitely, definitely the man in Canapolis. His he can hit. He can hit like there's no tomorrow, and it's to all fields. He can recognize breaking stuff. Mm. Um, he's got great power, considering he's not a big guy, but he's got he's got great power. He can take it out to any field. Um, defensively, he's a work in progress as well, but uh, but he's really fun to watch, and he's the kind of guy that when I'm tweeting during the ball games, <laughs> if he comes to the plate, I'm going <laughs> to stop, stop tweeting. And <laughs> If we ever catch you tweeting during Jose Rodriguez, you're going to get some what for from us because, yes, that's the Frank Thomas where you just stop and you got to watch uh, because you might just end up dropping your beer when you hear the crack of the bat. And you're like, oh, man, I didn't know he's up yet. Um, uh, as a guy as a guy who never gets anything right about this stuff, I'm tickled the fact that I really fell in love with the guy just the little I saw of him and followed him in Arizona. It's so nice to see that carry over uh, even uh, even partially because obviously, as you point out, the fielding is still just like, okay, we're he's going to figure something out. We don't know what it's going to be, uh, but he's, he's certainly not there yet. Um, how much of this, Dan, this speaks to a little bit of the role you've, you, you've played for some of these guys, and we don't need to get too much into that, but clearly there is still a transition for these guys. A, a huge swath of people, uh, of players in Kannapolis right now are international free agents. Uh, these are guys who are still in, really incredibly uh, young, uh, and they're in an entirely different country. They are still, in probably many cases, still grasping, obviously, culture, language. Uh, and this is also now in almost every case, or in many cases, and probably the majority of cases, their first full season ball stateside, coupled with the fact that that because of the pandemic restrictions or whatever, maybe it's just the new order with the Major League Baseball and Minor League Baseball relationship, that some of maybe the creature comforts that players uh, in that position could maybe fall back in the past, maybe aren't able to get as easy access there. Is that playing a role that we're just not able to see when we're just looking at box scores where these guys are just sort of grasping this is their craft, this is their job? I know for many of us, it's like, okay, well, yeah, they go and play baseball. They learn baseball, right? But it's, there's, a, there's a lot of dynamics behind the scenes that, that us as fans probably aren't able to see. Um, absolutely. They have a, a young lady that travels to the different affiliates and helps them work on their English. And uh, their English is a lot better than my school, <laughs> I can assure you. Um, some of them take to it quicker than others, uh, but the team definitely wants to help make them succeed. They don't want them to struggle to communicate. They want them to be able to go to the store. They want them to be able to function normally. Um, you know, it makes it easier for them to develop as ball players if they have a comfort level outside of the stadium as well. There's also a host family that's been hosting uh, Latino players for many years probably more than a decade and uh she usually keeps three or four sometimes five kids there and uh it's just a great family uh her name's joanne fugit and her uh her son eli um they're just phenomenal people and she's got more stories than you could ever imagine <laughs> she told me a story about eduardo escobar when he was dead <laughs> um she said that he was in a terrible slump and he called home and talked to grandma. Uh, grandma told him that he needed to, uh, needed to take a bath in white rose petals um, in order to break the slump. And uh, she told me that she had cleaned out every local flower shop <laughs> and she was just praying that he would come out of this cold street quickly so she would stop having to buy white <laughs> flower, white roses for him to take a bath in. But uh, she's got a lot of good stories like that. And I mean, and Eduardo Escobar was never really a prospect with us. And uh, look what he's done. So maybe that's the key. Maybe maybe she needs to buy more white roses. Eduardo Escobar had some style because I was covering the team at the time when he got called up. And I remember he showed up, man. He was styling some very, yeah, I think you might call it loud, but man, he it was it was a bold fashion same. I was like, all right, this guy's got some confidence. I like seeing it right off the bat. He walks in, opens himself up to uh, you know some fingers pointed at a veteran team. Um, Aaron Santana is uh, is sort of the leader of that uh, academy. We've had her on the podcast before. Somehow, Aaron Santana is talking on this Southside Sox podcast before we've talked. Dan, that's that's a crime and sin. Okay, Jose Rodriguez, 
Brian Ramos, another guy who seems like he's really um, stood out this season. Is there somebody else? I mean, those are two guys that are sort of leaping off the page, certainly offensively. Uh, I think Brian's mostly been uh, D18. I'm not certain of that. Uh, but it, it, this, is somebody maybe we're, we're maybe missing that you've got your eye on saying, all right, it, what he's doing is more than what you're seeing maybe in the box score, uh, you know, one way or the other. Uh, there's a couple other guys that I really like. Um, Chase Krogman is one. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he got hit on the hand early in the season, right. went back to Arizona, came back. He was struggling a little bit. He was dealing with some vision stuff, um, got some new contacts. They didn't quite work out. They had to tweak his uh, prescription. Mm-hmm. And now I think he's dialed in. But now, once again, it's a young guy that has never played full season. So, you know, there's growing pains. But when he hits the ball, he he puts it a hurt, a hurt on the ball. Him. Um, Cabrera Weaver has some really good, uh, good tools. He's, he's unbelievably, he's quick. He can play good defense. He has huge power for, uh, I mean, he is right. a very slender guy. Yeah. Um, if you see, I mean, he looks, he's 21. I mean, which makes him old for Canapolis, but um, he looks, he's got the body of a high school kid. He just mm-hmm. doesn't, I mean, he looks like he's a sophomore. <laughs> I bet you he's got a 28 inch waist. Um <laughs> But I saw him hit a – they called it foul. I say it was fair, yeah. but I believe it was 437 feet. Um, he absolutely crushed the ball. So he's got good power, uh, good defense, and he can run. And uh, once again, swing and miss. Same with DJ Gladney. You know, he's big power, um, a lot of swing and miss. There's a whole bunch of that all over Canapolis. Two of the guys – two of the first two guys you mentioned, though, uh, Chase, it's ironic that I guess you're, you're mentioning actual vision issues with Chase Krogman, who from the start seems like he's shown a, a, a pretty discipline – a lot of swing and miss, but also discipline. He's able to – he will he will take a walk. And Cabrera uh, Weaver, also a guy – who seems like of late uh, didn't start out that way, but he's taking, you know, just from, I'm looking, you know, really, this is almost exclusively box score reading box score scouting, but seeing more free passes, I'm guessing it's not because pitchers are necessarily pitching around a guy who looks like he's a sophomore in high school, the 28 inch waist. Uh, But that type of thing at a Canapolis level has got to, I mean, it's probably not the most impressive thing for you watching, but uh, it doesn't hurt to, to get that tool in their belt as soon as possible. For sure. And, you know, I think walks are up all over the minors. I don't know how much of it is because of okay. the year off that the pitchers had. Um, yeah. I'd, I'd really like to, to be able to figure that out. But it seems like guys are taking more walks, um, except for uh, Jose Rodriguez. He doesn't, he doesn't take a lot of walks. He likes to swing the bat. He definitely would prefer to get on with a hit than a walk. Yeah, it's working, so don't, oh, don't yeah, necessarily absolutely. change it because it's working. Put one off the wall. And, you know, don't take a walk. Okay, um, pretty much anybody in the system has come uh, in front of you, Dan. Uh, come through Canapolis, uh, guy. You've uh, guys. You've probably had some some pretty intimate knowledge of and scouting of. So let's talk now beyond Canapolis, whether it's Winston Salem. Uh, Birmingham, even up to Charlotte. What are you seeing in the system? You got guys like uh, Luis uh, Gonzalez, is Charlotte, who seems like uh, this last time he got called up by the White Sox, some light bulb went off because he's been hitting like gangbusters since he got demoted back down to Charlotte. But there's a number of other guys that have come through that, you know, who knows, maybe, whether you tab them or maybe they're surprising you now. Who, who are some guys that you're sort of keeping an eye on uh, above the Canapolis rung? Uh, who, are, who are impressing or, or maybe disappointing you uh, so far in this season with, with a year off? Uh, Lenin Sosa has been really good. Mm-hmm. Um, he's a great defender. I don't think he gets nearly enough credit um, for his defense, as a matter of fact. And uh, his hitting has been, been really good this year. He had a 20-game hitting streak. Uh, I think he was hitting about 400 during that time frame. Uh, he looks like he's taking more pitches. He's not being at, he's being more selective aggressive than just all out aggressive. Um, and it served him well. So he looks really good at Winston Salem, um, over in Birmingham, Roman Gonzalez has been very good. Mm -hmm. I think he's got 15 home runs, either 14 or 15 home runs. And that includes some downtime because he got hit on the hand. Mm -hmm. Um, the guys told me that when he showed up for spring training this year, that, uh, his body looked unlike they have ever seen. Um, and I heard, I heard rumblings that he has a ridiculously low body fat percentage. It's so low that I don't even want to quote it because it seemed like he couldn't. <laughs> but 
I, I heard he had a like the two and a half percent body fat, and I mean that it doesn't seem possible, but it was said with conviction, so I don't know. Um, there, there seemed like a lot of responses you could get to when your parent team or, or when your organization says, "Hey, you know, uh, we we might move you from um, left field to say like shortstop this year. What do you think?" And there's probably a lot of reactions you might have. Getting your body fat down to two and a half percent might not be the first one to me, but I think it's working for him because he's playing. I think a a, a respectable uh, shortstop. So I mean. What he's doing this season from 2019, you have to add the layer of position change. I know he was a guy who was a little bit of a Swiss Army player to begin with, but position change on top of it and left field, like to short or outfield, wherever, wherever he was in 2019, to shortstop, that's not usually the direction you go. He's played every position but pitch and caught in his minor league career. Um, he was also a very good uh, high school quarterback. So we're talking about a super athlete and another. I mean, he's a one percenter. The kid works and works and works and he doesn't quit. And uh, I wanted to do a story about him and I reached out to him and he told me that, you know, he said, I appreciate the work that you do He goes, but I'm not really into talking about myself. That's just the kind of guy he is. So, uh, I mean, I respect it. I wanted to do a story on him, but, <laughs> Come on. but, I, but I do respect it, that he, you know, he's all baseball. He's very business and he wants to get after it. So. And the, what he's done, again, not to make too much of just this, this one year, this, this gear shift from 2019 to 2021, although, of course, you know, we've got a year off. So that adds, adds a whole nother like extra obstacle uh, for him to have run through. Um, th what he's done from 2019 to 2021 in Birmingham, uh, that's the kind of stuff, obviously, all these guys are on the Sox radar, but that's the kind of stuff that gets the front office's attention and, and sort of keeps it. Absolutely. I'm sure that they were impressed with what he had done with his body. They were impressed with uh, the results that they've seen. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the position change, the shortstop. I, I think that there's probably nobody, and I, not, I don't know this firsthand, but I would say that there's probably nobody that has anything negative to say about what Romy's done. Mm -hmm. um, Micah has been amazing this year as well. Um, it's nice to see him healthy. It's nice to see him hitting 400 foot bombs with regularity. Um, you know, he's always struck out a lot. He's probably going to continue to strike out. Even if he, you know, when he makes the major leagues, he's going to strike out. But uh, nobody, I've, I've seen, you know, guys at Kannapolis and throughout the system for the last, uh, since 2016 is when I started going to games regularly down here. And I don't think I've ever seen someone who consistently hits the ball as hard as Micah does. Mm. Um, he has, uh, you know, Mike Stanton, uh, Aaron Judge kind of exit velos and distances. Um, he's a physical specimen. The guy is just, he's built like a Greek god. He looks like a statue, a Roman statue. Um, he's got the biggest paw you've ever seen. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, He's jacked. He works out like crazy. He uh, has a cannon for an arm. I dream on on what Miker could have been had the three years of injuries, you know, all the, the disjointed development time. If that wouldn't have happened, I just wonder where he would be right now. And I still think there's hope for him to be something, but, uh, you know, he, he's – He's fun to watch. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be hard for it to be with the White Sox, given where they're at, given with the fact that after this season, they would really have to make a decision on him, which is pretty much the decision has to be he's in the major leagues now. Um, it does seem like the, the clock is running out on him, and I think that's maybe part of the reason why he is still in Birmingham. It's clicking for him there. I mean, this is a guy by any account should be in Charlotte, right? If not, maybe Chicago should be in Charlotte. Um, and, you know, that's maybe a sort of a downside of what you see guys going through where sometimes, you know, the, the fit's not there bad breaks and, and sometimes just you run out of time to, particularly in the case of a micer with the injuries with the fact he he signed so young um you know his window you know with the white Sox is sort of you know coming to an end uh, and and you know it does seem like he's going to end up having to move to a team that's a lot younger that can take a risk with a guy like him and, and apparently it's not the way it could have been i guess but it apparently isn't uh, going to be the white Sox because he you know he hasn't been able to move up from Birmingham, despite having some results that um, are pretty eye popping. Well, the, the problem with, you know, Charlotte is we had uh, Gavin out in the outfield. We got Rutherford in the outfield, Luis Gonzalez in the outfield. Goodwin was in the outfield. Um, there's not really a spot for Miker. Um, 
with those guys ahead of him in, in service yep. time. Well, Mike has been around longer, but, right. uh, but those guys were ahead of him already. Mm -hmm. You know, he would have had to right. leave right over the top. Um, but if they're trying to build trade value in Mike, I would think they want him in Charlotte where he could hit, I mean, an ungodly <laughs> amount of home runs. And, you know, sometimes your best pitching prospects are double a yeah. rather than, rather than triple a, you know, you can be pitching, I mean, hitting against retreads and, you know, hang arounders rather than, you know, the true prospects. So if they wanted to build trade value, I would think that uh, Charlotte would be where it's at. Yes. It's a challenging chess game where it's like, okay, what are the other teams thinking? What do we want to see the results of be? Should we, you know, should we superstitiously move anything? Um, I, I mentioned Luis. I know you've been a huge Luis guy. Uh, he's sort of been a victim a, a little bit of the numbers game. He's it, it's really clicked for him at this moment. Uh, both his his really mini audition with the White Sox was impressive. Uh, put up a, a 0.2 or so war, definitely contributed in a very, very small role for the team. And then went back down to Charlotte and just gone bananas in a way that he probably has never at Charlotte and maybe he hasn't as a pro, but it's certainly it's been a while. Um, again, there's a squeeze. You've got everybody and their cousin, you know, coming out to play corner outfield for the White Sox. You got Andrew Vaughn and Gavin Sheets in the outfield when they really never have played in the outfield before essentially this year. Um, that, that's a tough squeeze for a guy. And you know, what, what do you, what do you think goes through his head? What, what do you see in him in terms of what his prospects for the, uh, you know, the organization still are? I've always liked him. Um, I think that he is average or better in every, at all tools. Um, he's not much of a base stealer, but he's not slow. You know, he, he's can run. He's got a really strong throwing arm. He was a two way, uh, two way player in college as a pitcher and outfielder um, early on. He's got mostly gap to gap power, but when he gets into it, I mean, he can hit the ball out of the park and I can see him with the major league baseball. I could see him, uh, you know, hitting 15 to 20 home runs in the season. I can see him consistently keeping a batting average above 275, 280 range. Um, it's just a lot to like with him. He's a premier defender. What's funny is, you know, I talked about what a premier defender is, and I, I said that a thousand times on Twitter and whatnot. You know, when he gets called up, I'm all pumped up, and I want to, you know, trumpet his virtues. And uh, the first ball hit to him, he makes it. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Come on, Luis. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that too, thinking, oh man, hold on. This isn't what the Scott Report said. Hold on. Hold on. Uh, Dan, I'm uh, sorry. Dan, we've been talking a lot, pretty much exclusively about hitters. And let's not get into the young guys because the young pitching um, core has, if not struggled, you know, the results haven't been great. So let's let's just let that lie for now because they're sorting themselves out. But let me just throw some names. I want I want to know who stands out to you as a guy who has the best chance of of making a, a, a second wave impact or even that like fifth starter in the future impact as the White Sox rotation this year has been loaded, seems sort of like set, even though, you know, we know the White Sox are not going to sign six premium guys for the rotation because they barely got three going into this season. But uh, you got guys who are doing pretty well in the organization. This year. Taylor Varnell. Connor Pilkington, Cade McClure, uh, and of course the, the more hype names at Charlotte, um, Jonathan Stever, Jimmy uh, Jimmy Lambert, you maybe even maybe even like Johan Dominguez who's put up some some decent numbers. Um, who, who among those you know jumps out at you? You know I know different levels, uh, different competition, different ages. Um, who, who impresses you? Who who's sort of got more of your eye? I love Jonathan Stever. I think very favorably of him. Um, Remember, we're in Charlotte, launching pad. Uh, you, can't, you can't make mistakes in Charlotte. If you make mistakes, they're going to get hit out of the ballpark. Um, whereas if it was a, a more fair ballpark, you know, that would be a fly out. And uh, it's just a rough place to pitch. And I wouldn't put a whole bunch of credence into, a, into an ERA in Charlotte. Um, it's more about strike out to walk. Yeah. And uh, – and he was really unbelievably good at that in 2019. He was throwing 70 percent strikes. He's not throwing like that now, but uh, he's another one. He's he's one of them hard workers. And sometimes those guys that you know they're detail obsessed. And when things go sideways for them, I think they kind of maybe get in their own head a little bit. And uh, 
he's definitely one of those one of those guys, you know, a one percenter. Um, I hope he he turns around. You see flashes definitely at Charlotte for him, yeah. and I, I I have faith that he'll he'll recover. Um, over at Double A Birmingham, I'm a big fan of Jason Billis. Uh, he, oh yeah, Jason. Yeah, forgot about him. Yep. He throws hard. He's throwing more strikes than ever, and uh, he's looked good. Uh, he had a reason. The last start that he had, uh, he developed a blister on his finger early on. He tried to pitch through it. Um, he was having a hard time gripping the ball. He got lit up. It, that wasn't truly a representation of him. That was more of trying to pitch through a blister and it affecting his his game. He wanted me to let everybody know that as well. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah and he's sort of following although like, with greater success because steve sort of had that like a little bit of a struggle on the first half then got promoted and went bananas and suddenly became like the sort of in a sense the top you know lower the top pitching prospect for the white Sox, and then 2020 he's pitching in the major leagues uh jason is sort of following that pattern although again great success right out of the gate uh, this year and maybe you know it's slowing down a little bit uh as to be expected in in, in birmingham uh and blisters aside um th so these guys have i mean obviously they're not exactly the same pitcher but you know these guys have a similar profile uh including people not necessarily um thinking much of them you know jonathan stever was was heralded enough but certainly wasn't certainly wasn't the white Sox top pitching prospect at any time and forced his way into that conversation uh they didn't even know what to do with jason um, um or you know they're trying him out re relieving starting uh, nobody's exactly sure and then suddenly he's like well forget it just give me the ball in the first inning and then just try and take me out and that's pretty much been his 2021 uh, yeah he's i was really hyping him as far back as 2019 when he was in Kannapolis. Um, I like, I like to see guys that can start, start as long as, you know, as long right. as they worthy until they prove that they can't anymore and then move them off of starting. Uh, he might be a bullpen guy long-term, but he's got a, he's got a power arm. He's got good breaking balls. Um, he's a nice pitcher. Him, Lane Ramsey has been very, very good. Mm -hmm. I mean, six foot nine right-hander. <laughs> arms and legs coming at you from down, you know, throwing from, from the top of the mountain and he's bringing it, you know, 97 through 99. Yeah. I'm not digging in. <laughs> um, the, the one guy that was really impressive was Luke Schilling and yeah. it's, it was not great. You know, the, the injury that sucks. I'm disappointed. Um, the kid, he throws very hard. You know, he was up 97 range frequently. He told me he was up to 99 in spring training. Um, his curveball and his slider both have elite spin rates. We're talking off the charts. Um, he was probably going to be a fast riser as long as he could throw strikes. He, I mean, he's the kind of guy that could move up two levels, you know, in, in a season. And uh, then Tommy John, you know, yeah. well, likely Tommy John. I right. think he's trying to figure out – his options he was looking at maybe rehabbing it or trying to see if it was possible to rehab but uh he said he's got time to wait it out and figure out the, the path forward but yeah. i'd like to see him uh I'd like to see him come back better than ever yeah what's your sense uh you know and i'll let you roll here shortly dan because you've given us a bunch of great time what a, a little more esoteric question i suppose uh, the, these guys by and large aside from alt site and alt site still isn't real real games in 2020 um, these guys basically are all off a year. Um, and for the hitters, obviously their, their timing, there, there are issues there, but for the pitchers, it seems like it's, it's maybe even more imperative to handle these guys responsibly and smartly is the sense that there's a little bit more caution with these guys and, and not wanting to push them too hard and give them too hard a load. Are you, are you seeing or anticipating that the 2021 workload for the, the pitchers would be basically what it would have been 2020, or is there a little extra element because the White Sox maybe they weren't on top of every one of these guys to know what they were doing? Uh, is there just um, erring on the side of caution when it comes to treating these arms uh, because we're now, you know, we're, we're two years away from actual competitive ball uh, and still now only a, a couple few months in, um, is there a sense of caution or is it just, okay, this is basically what 2020 would have been. Unfortunately, everybody is a calendar year older, but, um, you know, is it still, is it more 
okay, just, you know, go because <laughs> baseball doesn't wait. Baseball doesn't stop. I feel like they're probably making a cognizant effort to, uh, to decrease their workload. I don't know when they adopted the 30 pitch rule per inning, but if a pitcher throws 30 pitches, he does not return for the next inning. Even if, you know, I, I think that happened early in the season with uh, mm. Kelly. And then I was worried that maybe he was hurt because I saw a box score and saw, wow, he only went two thirds of an inning. Um, but, uh, or I'm sorry, one and two thirds innings. Um, so I don't know if that's a new thing with the 30 pitch inning rule or not. Um, I know that the pitchers don't like it when they feel like they're throwing well and they get out of a, a, a jam and they, they have a high pitch count. I know they want to go back out there for another inning, but I have not seen a lot of long, uh, long efforts. You know, even when a guy seems to be dealing in 60 pitches and it seems like uh, they're ready to give him the hook, even if he's uh, doing fine. Um, and I'm sure that's a lot COVID related. Yeah. And not to hit, because I don't know, um, you've been witnessing enough um, errors and the like that maybe you've just been distracted in Kannapolis. And I know you're not just exclusively a Kannapolis viewer, but that is sort of your, your home base. I know every level has different um, rule tweaks. Um, what is it at low A, if, if you even know or remember, and, and how is the, the rule tweak? playing out because it seems like these days baseball is just like sort of like let's just throw things up in the air and see what does stick and we're seeing it at the major league level so i'm curious to know what it is at kannapolis oh at winston they got that the balk thing going on oh right 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 at, at IA. i don't and i don't even know how it plays or how it has changed anything because i mean as much as we all love baseball who has ever understood the balk unless you <laughs> bring an umpire um and even then, sometimes when they exactly. call it, you're like, what was that called? Mm -hmm. I, I don't I don't even know the, the, the enhancement that they made to the ball crew, but I believe it was designed to try to uh, to encourage more more running. Um, you know, it seems like uh, in, in Manfred's quest to destroy the game that we love, he um, is trying to uh, bring back the old school mentality of, uh, you know, hitting, keeping the ball in play and uh, and running and small ball and it a little bit more, uh, but uh, I don't know whether it's made a big difference or not. I've seen a couple of balls when I've been watching games on TV, but uh, I don't really, I don't really know. Yeah, you have to look at the numbers. Like even like say a uh, uh, Romeo Gonzalez, uh, he's had some pretty good success. He's had a, a nice number of stolen bases, and so then you therefore think, okay, well, how much of that is an effect of, because it's at least partially effect. Maybe it's 1%, maybe it's 50% of these new rules and not being able to help, not being able to go to first as often. I mean, these are some crazy things being inflicted upon baseball. And I guess, I, okay, I guess for experimental purposes, I'm not really sure I would do it at say like double A uh, or in the major leagues, but uh, you know, it's, that's the world we're living in now, Dan. So I guess, uh, I guess, I guess we want to try some stuff out. <laughs> Um, the, uh, um, uh, the season is, uh, we're approaching that halfway through. We've finally talked, Dan, we're going to have to do this again soon. And guess what? Everybody, everybody listening, special treat, because we are going to have Dan probably next week, another South side on the farm podcast. Who knows? Maybe we'll get him for a couple, but, uh, we're going to work it in a schedule because we've got another great piece coming again. I'm te I'm just teasing it. I'm not even going to give you much detail, but it is another a piece on the level of the draft piece. You probably already read by now because you paused, went and read like I told you to, and then you came back and listened to the rest of this podcast. Uh, absolutely on that level. And probably I would argue probably a better piece uh, going to be terrific next week. We're going to have a nice conversation. Uh, me and Dan, who, who else? Maybe I'll let Darren crash. He might've got his Kannapolis hat, but he's still waiting on a Kannapolis hat. And I'm convinced that the losing streak, the losing ways have to do with the fact that Darren is not donning a new cannonballers cap. I don't know what his problem is. He's got to get with the program. He represents every affiliate except cannonballers. It ain't right. I got to bump that guy off. But Dan, you might you might have a permanent spot now. Sorry, Darren. I hate to do this too when you're, not, when you're not able to defend yourself. Dan, thank God. It's the big free agent acquisition. And believe me, SB Nation, he's waiting for that signing bonus just like I am. So call him after you call me. Dan, finally, we got to talk. Let's do this again sooner than, say, three years from now. Sounds great. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks, everybody, as always, for reading and for listening, sometimes even watching. And uh, we're going to be back actually with Dan Victor sooner than you think, but we're going to have podcasts rolling out all week. So thanks everybody again for reading, for listening, and we'll have something at you very, very soon.